What's up, Solo fam? My name is John Solo, and I'm happy to see ya. In last week's episode of Messed Up Origins, where we talked about the shockingly messed up book, The Adventures of Pinocchio, I told you guys that if we got to 5,000 likes by the end of the week, I'd make a sequel episode where we explore the second edition of the book, which expands on the first edition's depressing ending. I wasn't surprised at all to see the Solo fam shatter that goal, and because you earned it, I'm delivering on my end of the deal. If you haven't seen last week's episode, first off, uh, I thought we were friends, so what's that about? And second, I highly recommend you do, because it might be my favorite episode we've ever done. Also, I don't want to spoil it for you, and I'm going to in like 10 seconds, so go watch it. There's a link in the description. Before we pick up where the story left off, with Pinocchio hanging from a tree, let's do a quick recap of Disney's Pinocchio, because the events that happen in this part of the book heavily inspired it. As always, if you like this series and want to help the channel out, hit that like button with all your heart and help us reach our goal of 3,000 likes. The movie opens with an Italian woodcarver named Geppetto finishing up his new marionette and naming him Pinocchio. That night, he wishes upon a star for the puppet to become a real boy, and the blue fairy grants his wish. The fairy tells Pinocchio that if he proves himself brave, truthful, and unselfish, he'll become a real human boy, and she assigns Jiminy Cricket to be his conscience. Geppetto is thrilled to find that Pinocchio's come to life, and the very next day sends him to school. Only Pinocchio gets distracted by a scumbag fox and cat who convince him to join Stromboli's puppet show for an easy path to fame and fortune. Even though he's a hit with the crowd, Pinocchio doesn't get any of the puppet show's revenue himself, and when he tries to go home, Stromboli locks him in a birdcage and their wagon takes off. The Blue Fairy comes to Pinocchio that night and after making him and Jiminy promise to not make any more mistakes, she sets him free. Only he finds himself getting swindled once again into going to Pleasure Island with a group of misfit boys. It's on this island that young, stupid boys are encouraged to act on every impulse and desire they have. But after less than a day of degenerate behavior, the boys start transforming into donkeys and are sold to the salt mines as slaves. Pretty freaky. Pinocchio and Jiminy escape the island and learn that Geppetto was eaten alive by a giant whale named Monstro while searching for the missing puppet. Pinocchio takes on the responsibility of saving Geppetto himself, and despite the risk involved, he pulls it off successfully. Well, mostly successfully. He actually dies in the process, but because he acted so bravely and selflessly to save his father, the Blue Fairy brings him back to life as a real human boy, and that weird little family lives happily ever after. There's no denying that Disney did an amazing job with Pinocchio, without a doubt one of their greatest films of all time. But as we all know, because it's what this entire series is about, they like to scale back on some of the more intense elements of whatever story they're adapting. Pinocchio was no exception, both the story and the character himself. The irresponsibility and poor decision making he showed in the movie was several times worse in the book, and that's how he found himself hanging from a tree, slowly choking to death, courtesy of the fox and cat. Originally, this is where the story ended. It was meant to show young people but what'll happen if you refuse responsibility and just do whatever's immediately gratifying instead. Essentially sacrificing the great person that you could be for the underdeveloped mess that you currently are. But in 1833, readers weren't happy with this ending. They loved the rest of the book, but they wanted Pinocchio to have a full story arc where he redeems himself and becomes a good person. And I think that's reasonable. How much would any of us have liked the Emperor's new groove if he died in the jungle with the Panthers and the movie was just over. So when the author's publisher reached out to him to ask about a possible expansion to the adventures of Pinocchio, Carlo was like, sure, I'll just write another 15 chapters. And here we are, almost 200 years later, still talking about him. Now remember, while the fox and cat did string up Pinocchio in the tree, they left him alone after a while because they got bored watching him suffocate. And also, he didn't know it was the fox and cat because they were in disguise. So when he runs into them later and acts all buddy-buddy, that's why. He didn't know it was them. It ends up being the fairy with turquoise hair that saves Pinocchio's life, even though she just turned him away moments before. She looked out her window and saw him hanging lifelessly from a tree, so she sent a hawk to help him down and a stagecoach to bring him back to the house. She calls in three famous doctors to gauge the puppet's condition. The first two, an owl and crow, couldn't give a definite answer. Probably because they weren't real doctors. I bet you they were like chiropractors or something. The third doctor was actually the ghost of the talking cricket that Pinocchio killed 
involved in the first few chapters. He said Pinocchio would be all right, but he's irresponsible and a terrible son. That's gotta sting, right? Even if your heart's made of wood? The fairy tries to give Pinocchio some medicine to speed along the healing process, but he refuses until four rabbit undertakers come to the house with a coffin to take his body away. This gets his attention. He drinks the medicine and pretty much instantly feels better, but now it's time to explain to the fairy how he got himself in such a predicament. He tells her everything that happened with the cat and fox leading up to the incident, but when she wants to know what happened to his gold coins, he starts to lie. This chapter is what served as inspiration for the nose growing scene in the movie. According to the fairy, there's two types of lies, one that makes your legs grow shorter and another that makes your nose longer. Of course, Pinocchio's lies are the nose growing kind, and soon enough he can't turn his head in either direction without knocking something over. At first, the fairy thinks it's kind of funny because she's just trying to teach him a lesson, but he starts to get really upset, and after a few hours of listening to him cry, she summons a thousand woodpeckers to peck his nose back to its normal size. The fairy seems to truly care about Pinocchio, so she makes him an offer. He and Geppetto can move in with her, and she'll help raise him as if he was her little brother. It turns out that Geppetto is already on his way over, and Pinocchio is super excited to see him and apologize for being such a crappy son. It looks like the puppet's finally trying to make some changes, but as Mike Tyson once said, change comes in time, so his morals are still a work in progress. He leaves the house to search for his father, and therefore hopefully see him a little sooner, but on his way, he runs into the fox and cat. The cat is still missing his paw from when Pinocchio bit it off in self-defense, but for some reason, the puppet can't put two and two together. It takes a lot of convincing, but the cat and fox once again persuade Pinocchio to come with them to the Field of Miracles and bury his gold coins, which they claim will then sprout gold coin trees. After the coins are buried, the group splits up, but when Pinocchio returns to the field 20 minutes later, he finds that he's been scammed and his coins have been stolen. He runs to the courthouse in the nearby city of Catch Fools, which is populated by people who sacrifice their future well-being for immediate satisfaction. There's hairless dogs, featherless chickens, butterflies without wings. It's a rough sight. Carlo added a symbolic detail when describing the city, saying that every once in a while, a beautiful stagecoach would pass through that was driven by either a fox, a hawk, or a vulture. These animals are all predators and scavengers and likely played a role in the downfall of the rest of the city's residents, just like the rich scumbags who populate our planet. When Pinocchio gets to the courthouse, he explains everything that happened with the fox and cat to a gorilla judge who has sympathy for the puppet, but even still chose to punish him for the crime of foolishness. After being in jail for four months, Pinocchio starts on his way back to the fairy's house, which he soon discovers is no longer there and was replaced by a gravestone. Pinocchio starts crying and a nearby pigeon overhears this and offers to take him to the beach where Geppetto is currently building a raft to go look for him. When he's dropped off, he rushes to the coast and sees Geppetto far out in the distance. He tries to swim out to him, but the current keeps pushing him back, and then he sees a giant wave come crashing down on Geppetto's raft. He tries swimming out and saving Geppetto once again, but the old man's body is gone, so he ends up swimming to the nearby island of Busy. Everyone on this island spends their entire day working and doing chores, and it takes some time for Pinocchio to grasp this concept of working hard and earning something. He offers to help a woman bring her water jugs to her house in exchange for a drink, and soon he realizes that she's the fairy with turquoise hair, just somehow older. She makes a deal with Pinocchio that he can live with her and she'll act as his mother if he goes to school, and she hints that if he's good for an entire year, he'll become a real boy. There's a few hiccups along the way, including a fist fight, but Pinocchio works hard and manages to rise to the top of his class, and the fairy tells him that come tomorrow, he'll be a real boy. She also says they should throw a party to celebrate, and he goes out to invite all his friends from school. See, back in the day, you couldn't just make a Facebook event if you were having a party. You had to see people in person and physically hand them invitations, or mail them. But the point is, there was a physical invitation. It's when Pinocchio sees his friend Candlewick that trouble starts creeping over the horizon. Candlewick says he can't go to the party because he's waiting on his ride to Toyland, a place where no one has to work, and you can have fun all day doing whatever you want. Sounds too good to be true because it is. He invites Pinocchio to come along with him, and at first Pinocchio is like, nah, I spent the past year working my butt off in school, I'm gonna be a real boy. But Candlewick is really convincing, and how much discipline can you really expect a puppet to have when he's being sold the dream life? He ends up joining Candlewick on the wagon to Toyland, despite there being plenty of signs that he shouldn't. For example, the donkeys that were pulling the wagon were all wearing shoes, similar to the ones that Pinocchio was wearing. Not to mention, and one of the donkeys literally said, don't come with us, it's a really bad idea. Look at me, I'm a talking donkey with shoes on. Do you think 
think that's a little off? Pinocchio and Candlewick spend five months in Toyland living the dream life they always wanted. But one morning, Pinocchio wakes up to discover he's grown a set of donkey ears and so has Candlewick. Just like in the movie, the two learn the hard way that boys who don't study and try to grow up eventually turn into donkeys. And by the end of that day, their transformations were complete and Pinocchio was sold to a circus. Initially, he was expected to be a trick performing donkey, but after being trained and abused for three months, he sprained his ankle and was sold once again. This time to a man who planned on killing him and using his hide to make a drum. Apparently the man wasn't totally heartless because he felt bad looking into the donkey's eyes as he killed him. So get this. He ties Pinocchio's legs together and then ties a rope around his neck and throws him into the ocean. Once again though, Pinocchio's fairy was looking out for him and she sent a school of a thousand fish to eat the donkey parts off of them. So when the man fished him out, he was expecting a dead donkey but got a living puppet instead. He's pretty angry about the fact that he wasted money on a pretend donkey, but Pinocchio jumps back into the ocean before he can be turned into firewood. He swims as far away from land as he can, only to come across the terrible dogfish, the book's version of the whale monstro. He tries swimming back to land, but the dogfish catches up to him and eats him right up. Pinocchio decides to explore the belly of the beast, and who does he run into but Geppetto. The old man's been living in the dogfish's stomach for two full years, surviving off supplies from a larger ship the monster also swallowed. Unlike the movie where Pinocchio and Geppetto start a fire to make Monstro sneeze, they simply climb out of his stomach and ride to land on the back of a tuna. That sounds like a lot of fun, right? I wish I had a better relationship with the tuna community so I could give it a try. But the story isn't over yet. This is when Pinocchio really takes on the full responsibility of not just being a real boy, but a real adult. When looking for shelter, they actually run into the fox and cat from earlier in the story, only now they look more like the residents of Catch Fools. The cat's really gone blind after pretending to be for who knows how long, and the fox is hairless, has no tail, and lost function in one of his legs. They beg Pinocchio for help, but he tells them they got what they deserve and bids the false friends goodbye. He and his father stumble upon a cottage where they're welcomed inside, only to find the ghost of the talking cricket. He's still pretty bitter about Pinocchio killing him when they first met, but he lets them both move into his house because really, What's a cricket need a full house for? Right away, Pinocchio gets himself a job working for a farmer, the same farmer actually who bought Candlewick after he turned into a donkey. Unfortunately, Candlewick doesn't have a happy ending, and Pinocchio watches him die from being worked too hard and not given enough water. Even still, he works for the farmer in exchange for a glass of milk that he gives Geppetto every day. The old man's still recovering after living in the dogfish for so long. While all this is happening, Pinocchio really kicks it into high gear. He starts making baskets out of reeds and selling them and uses the money to buy food, water, and books, which he uses to teach himself to read and write. After months of saving, Pinocchio has enough money to buy himself a new suit, but on his way into town, he runs into a talking snail that he met on the island of Busy. The snail tells him that the fairy is dying and can't afford food or medicine, so without a second thought, Pinocchio hands over the 40 pennies he was going to use to buy his suit and returns home. That night, Pinocchio has a dream where the fairy visits him and gives him a kiss, and when he wakes up, he learns he's finally become a real boy. And to top it off, not only did the fairy give him a new suit and shoes, but also 40 gold coins in place of his 40 pennies. The story ends with Pinocchio and his father embracing and staring at his puppet body now sitting to the side. Pinocchio says happily how ridiculous I was as a marionette and how happy I am now that I've become a real boy. And with that comes the end of the story. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Without a doubt, this is one of my absolute favorite episodes of Messed Up Origins we've ever ever done, so thank you to everyone who requested I cover the Pinocchio story, especially my fantastic mother. If you want to support the series and help the Solo fam grow, make sure to hit that like button. I can't express enough how much that helps. Not only does it increase visibility for this video, it lets me know that you guys are enjoying the content and the effort that I put into these isn't going to waste. Also make sure to subscribe and turn notifications on for new videos just like this every single week. And if you're already subscribed, turn notifications on with your subscription because unfortunately just the sub box doesn't work anymore. Clap your hands if the people at YouTube suck at their job. And one final thing, these are your last few days to enter your name for the Twitter roast that I'm doing next week. All you gotta do is follow me and respond to this tweet, and if your handle's goofy enough, chances are I'm gonna roast ya. Thank you all for watching, Solo fam. Until next time, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.